Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our next MIF++ seminar. Today, uh, Jonathan Balassingham will talk about the recent paper, which is available on archive, the paper about graph representation of crystals using pointless distance distributions. Over to you, Jonathan, please. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. Um, so I want to get in with kind of our overarching problem that we want to address, and that is to apply machine learning methods onto uh, crystal property prediction. Um, and the reason behind this is that classical methods like density functional theory are computationally expensive. And in order to make them computationally feasible in the first place, you have to do some relaxations to the constraints, which end up introducing uh, its own error. Um, so by using machine learning methods, we're hoping to make these computations faster and to reduce the error of the predictions. Um, so uh, applying machine learning to this problem and, and regression problems just in general can kind of bro be broken down into these five steps. Um, the first of which is to create a representation for the data. Um, the data in this particular case would be a crystal structure. Um, the second would be to develop a machine learning model that can utilize this data um, for the task of uh, crystal property prediction. Um, uh, there have been a variety of models that have been used, kind of starting with more traditional machine learning methods like kernel regression, moving towards this kind of uh, world of deep learning with feed forward neural networks. And then as of late, uh, graph neural networks have become kind of exceedingly popular because they've, they've had the most success. And um, graphs are a very convenient way to kind of encode the structure of crystals and molecules and things like that. Um, then we have to train the model. This usually involves normalizing data, picking a loss function, mean squared error, mean absolute error for a regression task like this one. Uh, finally, we pick the optimization algorithm and we can train. Um, then we validate the model and the model which performs best on the validation set is selected to be applied to the test set. And then this final accuracy is what we will report. Um, so while there's been a ton of work put into this, the second step of develop, uh, developing machine learning models and algorithms um, using a variety of different components like convolutional layers or attention mechanisms, not as much work has been put into creating a representation for the data that has desirable properties. Um, so for that reason, we're going to be focusing on this on this very first step here in the hopes that um, other machine learning models can make use of this representation and inherently uh, improve their results. Um, so we have to talk about uh, the most popular graph representation to date, and that is called the crystal graph. Um, it was first uh, uh, created in, in a paper that was published in, I believe, 2017 called the Crystal Graph uh, Convolutional Network. Um, and since then, it's actually been um, one of the most used graph representations, if not the most used graph representation, in several other following works, um, some of which I've listed here, but there are probably roughly 10 to 12 um, other graph neural networks that make use of this graph representation. Um, in particular, I want to draw attention to this last one, Align, which was published I believe about two years ago, um, and it's currently the state of the art when it comes to crystal property prediction. It has the best accuracy of, of um, all of the models that have been applied to the materials project uh, data. So what is a crystal graph? Um, well, it's a graph where nodes represent atoms and edges represent the Euclidean distance between atoms and is parameterized by two values, k, which is the number of nearest neighbors in which to establish an edge, um, and R, which is the cutoff radius. Um, to create a crystal graph, um, the first step would be to establish a node in our graph for each one of the atoms within the unit cell. So if we take a very simple example on this right-hand side, this is lutetium silicon. Um, so we see in this unit cell, there are four atoms, two silicon and two lutetium. So our crystal graph will thus have four nodes. Um, for each one of these nodes, we're gonna find the uh, K nearest neighbors. In this example, um, we're using K equals two. Um, so uh, if that neighbor is within our cutoff radius of R, um, we can establish an edge between the two nodes. Um, so if we take, for example, this uh, lutetium atom here. 
its two nearest neighbors are this silicon atom within the unit cell and this other silicon atom outside of the original unit cell. So uh, in order to accommodate the fact that this is outside of the unit cell and we don't have a node in our graph which refers to it, we place an edge between the original atom and the node which refers to this atom under translation. So the result would be a node for this lutetium atom here with two edges one to this silicon atom and then the other to this silicon atom. Um, so to understand uh, what our graph representation is, you have to understand the basis of it, which is the point distance distribution. Um, and this is a matrix where each row corresponds to uh, Jonathan, a, uh, yes. could I ask, ask, ask a question about the previous mm -hmm. slide? Yes. Uh, could you comment a little bit about unit cells? Okay, uh, so so this unit cell um, is one of an infinite uh, number of selections that you could make. Um, and if you'll notice here, I mentioned that you have to establish a node for each one of the atoms within the unit cell, which means that should you use a different unit cell and the number of atoms changes, then the crystal graph will change accordingly um, to make sure that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between atoms uh, in the unit cell and nodes in the graph. So um, here you, you talked about um, primitive cells, so smallest by volume mm -hmm. and non-primitive. So your example shows a doubled cell. Right? Yes, yes. Just to exemplify the fact that if uh, your nearest neighbor might not necessarily be within the original unit cell. So because we do not have a node that represents this specific atom, we have to establish the edge between uh, the node, sorry, uh, the node which refers to that atom under translation. So the, the resulting graph is a directed multigraph where you can have multiple edges between the same uh, pair of nodes. Does that make sense? A bit clear? Can I have, let's say, yes, a small question? I mean, when you speak about nodes and edges, so say, do you distinguish different types of bonds from a chemical point of view? No, they do or not. Not on their valves or ionic ones. I mean, uh, not in this case. They simply represent Euclidean distance. So cool. just the distance. Yeah, just distance. Because I, I guess bonds are, uh, their definition, I guess, is kind of fuzzy, if you will. Um, so we can't definitively say if there's a, a bond there or not. And uh, this is also information that's not necessarily included um, in a SIF file. So we're just uh, working with the data that we that we have. Um, uh, and, and this is also, the, the crystal graph is not our version of things. This is the... Um, the, the past representation that's been used. So in order to make a graph that's better, but doesn't necessarily utilize more information, just the same information in a better way. Um, so we, we didn't try to look for, for uh, bond information and try to encode that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, could I clarify? So you consider uh, all neighbors up to a given cutoff radius. Yes, yes. Not, not restricting by types of bonds, but simply all geometric neighbors up to say, Two, three, well, six angstroms, for example. Yes, that is, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so our graph is based on the point-wise distance distribution. Um, I know some of you are already familiar with this, but for those of you that aren't, I'll quickly go over it. Um, so it is a matrix where each row represents an atom within the unit cell. And for each atom, we find the K nearest neighbor distances, and these will be the entries along the matrix. Um, and then for each one of these rows, we assign a uniform weight, one over M, where M is the number of rows in the PDD or the number of atoms in the unit cell. And once we have this, we collapse rows that are duplicates, where uh, a duplicate can have some level of tolerance, be close enough and be considered the same. So to take this PDD and turn it into an actual graph, we can perform the following steps. Um, so for a given crystal, we find uh, the PDD for some parameter K nearest neighbors and some tolerance, which is used to determine whether two rows are collapsed or not. For each row within this collapsed PDD, we allocate a node in the graph. And then for each entry, which represents the Euclidean distance to its neighbor, we establish an edge between uh, that row's corresponding node and the, the node which refers to that neighbor. And in a very similar way as the crystal graph, should this node, uh, should this atom rather fall outside of the original unit cell, then we find the node in the graph which refers to that neighboring atom under translation. And then finally, we add weights to the nodes of this graph um, that correspond to the weights within the PDD. 
And the result is also a directed multigraph with M nodes, where M is the number of rows within the collapse PDD, and MK edges. Um, and here is a very simple example using the uh, uh, using lutetium silicon from the previous slide. So here we have four atoms within the unit cell. This creates four rows within the uncollapsed PDD. Here are the distances to each one of its first and second neighbor. So K would be equal to two in this instance. If you'll notice, the first two rows are the exact same, and the second two rows are also the exact same. The first two refer to uh, lutetium. The second two refer to silicon. These can be collapsed and their weights are added. And then the final PDD graph will look something like this, where for each row, we have a node, and for each entry, uh, we have a corresponding directed edge. Um, is that clear to everyone? Perfect. Jonathan, um, what happens if you have two, um, two say, extreme neighbors at the same distance? So if that is the case, then they are arbitrarily chosen. If they are the exact same, then they would be arbitrarily chosen. Um, in the, in uh, like empirically, I haven't found that to be a problem. And if it is, if there is a situation where there is a tie, typically it's the same atom type, so it doesn't end up affecting things in any way. So could I clarify? Do you fix the number k of neighbors or yes. a cutoff radius? No, not a cutoff radius. We simply use the same k that is part of the PD. So whatever was used to create the PDD will. Uh, ultimately, that that's why we can uh, define how many edges there will be ahead of time, depending on the k that you choose and the number of rows in the PDD. So what's the difference with the previous crystal graph representation, which essentially used the cutoff radius? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there are a few notes on that that I will get to actually in in a couple of slides. Um, but yes, that that is one difference. And the second difference is that our PDD graph obviously is not tied. Uh, the number of nodes in our PDD graph are not are not tied to the number of atoms in the unit cell. They are tied to the number of rows in the final PDD. Um, and just as a comparison, you can see here that this is the case, um, that the use of node weights allows us to avoid this um, case where we have dependence on the choice of unit cell for a given crystal. Um, and these two examples were done with k equals two and a collapse tolerance of 10 to the negative sixth. Um, and in this case, the collapse tolerance did not matter because the two rows that we grouped together, or the two sets of rows rather that we grouped together, um, were exactly the same. But this does have an impact, and, and we'll show that later on. So I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks to me like you you don't take the number the atoms in the asymmetric unit. You take all of the atoms in the unit cell, and then collapsing automatically removes those that are symmetry related. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, okay, so in order to understand how uh, our graph representation gets utilized, you kind of need to understand, uh, generally speaking, how graph neural networks work. Um, so for today's model, we're going to be use a graph, using a graph convolutional network. Um, so in that case, in this specific case, this type of uh, graph neural network it does a series of convolutions for each um, node within the graph that you input. And all a convolution is really is you take the node that you want to perform the convolution on and you do something with its neighboring features and then update the embedding for that node. In this case, we do a simple addition, but there can be much more complex convolutions that you can come up with. Um, and once this is done for every node within the graph, um, that is considered one convolution. And this is typically done uh, repeatedly. And eventually what happens over the course of the convolutions is information from one node that might be more distant than other nodes will uh, traverse across the graph and be included. And then you kind of incorporate uh, more and more of your neighboring atom features within uh, a node's own embedding. And the result is, is uh, individual atom features that have uh, information from other nodes, and then we perform a readout, which turns these individual atom features into a single vector that is supposed to represent the entire graph. This uh, vector is then put into a multi-layer perceptron, and then finally the property is predicted. Um, but we mentioned earlier that our graph has node weights, uh, which is not 
part of the typical graph neural network framework. So how do we adapt uh, uh, GNNs to accommodate these node weights? And it turns out that we really only have to make two changes. Um, the first is to batch normalization, and the second is to the readout. So for those of you that don't know, batch normalization is a normalization technique where you normalize the features of the graphs within a batch. Um, and what I mean by that is, say we have a batch of two graphs. Here are the node embeddings for the first graph. And then here are the node embeddings for the second graph. We simply find the mean of the first feature, which is represented by this first column, the variance of this first column, and we normalize each of the values accordingly. Um, now to use weighted, uh, to incorporate our weights, because each one of these nodes has a weight, we simply use the weighted average and weighted variance and perform the batch normalization in the same way. Um, you also might notice that this graph is larger than the second graph, has double the number of nodes, which means that when you use normal batch normalization, the influence of the bias, uh, the, sorry, the influence of the uh, nodes in this graph will be higher uh, because there are more nodes contributing to that sample uh, mean and that sample variance. But because we're using for the weighted version of things, the PDD weights, which sum to one, this problem is actually reduced and we'll see the effect of that on, on the results. Um, second, I mentioned that we need to change our readout slightly. So some co very common readouts are normalized sum where you just sum each of the individual features and then you use normalization on the single vector. Um, max pooling, you just simply find the maximum of each of the features and then mean pooling, which is uh, the one that we're going to be using today. In order to you use mean pooling, uh, you just take the average of each of the features. But since we have weights, we simply take the weighted average of each one of these features. And um, this can be adapted to use weights for max pooling and normalize sum as well. For max pooling, you actually don't need to do anything with the weights because the maximum is not uh, dependent on the number of nodes. Um, and then for normalized sum, you can actually just use the weighted average as well and then normalize the result. Um, so we know what changes we have to make to the graph neural network to accommodate our node weights. We have a representation, but we need a model that we can actually use this on. And I decided to use the crystal graph convolutional neural network. Um, it is the model that came with the original crystal graph uh, several years ago. Um, and its performance actually stacks up very well today. It, is, it still performs uh, relatively well to even more complex methods. Um, so a single convolution within this graph can be defined by this, this very long equation here, but I only want to draw attention to one thing, which is this uh, part of the convolution, which uses element-wise uh, matrix multiplication. And essentially what this convolution does is it uh, creates a weight for how much we should incorporate a neighbor's node, uh, uh, the, the embedding of a, a neighboring node into our own embedding. And as you increase the distance, the weight is reduced, which means that the influence that a more and more distant node has on uh, the, the embedding that you're trying to perform the convolution on is decreased. Um, I say all this to say that it turns out that the authors note in their paper that because of the way the convolution is created, their parameter cutoff radius is actually uh, a bit redundant. So, um, because of that, we're going to use a high enough cutoff radius today for all examples using the crystal graph, such that they have at least, or they have the k, uh, k number of neighbors. Um, the other authors also note that if you end up using too high of a cutoff radius, end up pruning some of these edges off, the, the uh, resulting performance is actually lower. But because we want to try to make the best result possible for the crystal graph to compare to, um, we're going to be using a high enough cutoff radius such that uh, no edges are taken off. Um, so for training, uh, we're going to be using pre-standard 80-10-10 for our training, validation, and testing splits. The model with the best performance on the validation set will be applied to the testing set, and then that is the MAE, which we will report. Uh, we use mean squared loss and atom optimizer. Now for the actual embeddings for the nodes, um, we're using this very common uh, atom feature embedding that has been that was used by CGCNN originally, and uh, it's actually quite common in, in some of the other crystal uh, property prediction works. Um, 
essentially it is a one hot encoding of various properties um, into this in total 92, oops, sorry, uh, 92 dimensional vector. Um, so for example, if you have group number here, which is 18 dimensions, uh, if you have a group number of one, this will be represented in an 18 dimensional vector with just the first dimension being equal to one and the rest being zeros. Uh, this is the same case with period for electronegativity. This is a continuous value. So we do essentially the same thing, except these values are binned into ranges. Um, so should you found, uh, like should uh, the electronegativity of a particular atom species be in the lowest range, the first dimension will be equal to one. The rest will be equal to zero. Um, for the edge embeddings, we are simply using Euclidean distance, but this is also uh, one hot encoded. Um, with a dimension size of 40. So should you fall into the lowest bucket range, uh, you would have a one in the first dimension and then zeros for the rest of the dimensions. Um, and we're going to be applying this, uh, this representation and this model to two uh, data sets, the first of which is the materials project. This is fairly common in this task and is, it's uh, probably the most go-to benchmark that you can use. It has about 36,000 samples and the composition of the crystals within it are very, uh, are varied compositionally. Um, and we're gonna be predicting formation energy and band gap energy. We're also gonna be using the T2 data set, which is in comparison, much smaller. Uh, it also is completely homogeneous in its composition. And uh, we're going to be predicting lattice energy. Another thing that makes these two data sets uh, very different is the size of the uh, unit cells involved, or the number of atoms within the unit cell, rather. Um, the materials project averages roughly 25 or 26, whereas the T2 data set has uh, much larger uh, unit cells that contain and on average, about 360 uh, atoms. Mm -hmm. um, and because of this, the resulting graphs will also be just as large. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can a short question, let's say, to the previous slide. Mm -hmm. I, I got a bit lost. Why you need 18 dimensions for the space group number? Ah, I see, I see. I could not understand it. Um, so I'm not sure why they picked these dimensions in particular for the original paper. Uh, it's just it just seems that this this kind of embedding has been uh, become very popular. Um, the reason that they use one hot encoding in general is to try to introduce nonlinearity um, into the model, and this apparently improves performance. Um, but I'm not sure why they specifically chose this number of dimensions for for um, uh, each atomic property. Um, I think in the original paper, I might be able to find it. If, if, you're, if you're interested, I could, I could find that out for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, could I also clarify, uh, this group number, does it refer to a symmetry space group number or, or not? I think, I, I'm not sure whether it's space group. I, I, potentially. Um, this is just how they list it in, in their paper. Um, but I can look back and check. Okay. Um, okay, so for our first experiment, uh, we want to see how uh, changing the parameters of the PDD graph affects uh, the size of the graph. Um, one of our first goals was to try to improve upon the performance of methods like DFT with machine learning. So the size of the graph um, affects how quickly we can make predictions and do training. So here for the first four rows, we have the T2 data set and the last four are going to correspond to the materials project data set. The, um, where the tolerance is not indicated, this would be equivalent to the size of the crystal graph. Um, so 361 nodes in the graph, roughly, uh, for the T2 data set and about 26 for the materials project data set. And then the PD, PDD graph is indicated where tolerance is um, uh, uh, given. Um, and you can see that this, as you increase the tolerance, that means more and more collapses occur within the PDD ultimately shrinking the number of nodes within the PDD graph and allowing us to compress this representation. Jonathan, um, could I check NA not applicable? Does that mean zero? No, it does not mean zero. It means uh, that the crystal, uh, the, the uh, crystal graph, uh, which does not do any collapsing of any sort. So you can't really apply a tolerance to that. Um, if you were to use zero, exact uh -huh. zero, this number would be smaller. I see. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Right. So you're simply, you are simply not checking whether uh, rows in the PDD matrix are identical, even with zero threshold or not. Yes. So so it turns out that there's a really, it, it, once you create the PDD, um, and if you do no collapsing and you use the same methodology to create the PD graph, the PDD graph and the crystal graph will actually be the exact same. Mm -hmm. Does so that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the compression column, uh, it means um, the ratio of result resulting rows with respect to original rows. Yes. So so the percent, so mm -hmm. the percent of the number of nodes in comparison to the original amount, which would be this top yeah. number here. So this number 100 percent compression, it, it sounds a little bit yeah, it's it's it really should say not applicable because this is this is yeah, that is the the um starting amount. Yeah. Mm, maybe we could use a different, maybe a different word because even 78% compression, it sounds a large compression, but it, it is actually small, right? Yeah, this is the, the percent of the number of nodes. Okay. So it does it isn't it decreased by 78%, it's decreased by 22 and a half. Um yeah, I, I can change that to make it more precise. Um, I think there's a footnote in the actual paper that, that describes this a bit more, but yeah, compression is a little uh, misleading. Um, okay, um, so yeah, yeah, we have the same problem here, but uh, this table focuses on how um, compressing the graph using uh, collapses within the PDD, how that actually affects the prediction MAE. So the first five correspond to formation energy. The last five correspond to band gap energy. Um, the row where uh, the graph is PDD and the tolerance is not indicated means that we did not do any collapsing, but we did make use of the node weights. That is that we changed the uh, batch normalization to weighted batch normalization and the readout of the graph neural network to a weighted readout. And for band gap energy, you can see that uh, the results uh, ever so slightly improve despite shrinking the graph quite substantially um, with our best score even coming at uh, uh, 10 to the negative six tons. Um, but for formation energy, this is actually not true. So when we did no collapsing whatsoever, we got our best performance. Um, and that can be attributed to the fact that when we use weighted batch normalization and weighted readout, uh, spe sorry, uh, specifically weighted batch normalization, we remove the bias of larger graphs within the batch. Um, and this helps balance, and balance things out and results in a better MAE. Um, but when we do start collapsing, we can see that the MAE actually increases quite substantially. Um, and well, we have to answer the question of why is that? Um, well, it turns out that this occurs because when we're collapsing rows within the PD, we collapse rows that correspond to two different species of atoms. Um, and when the PD graph is formed, we arbitrarily choose between these two atoms. So you're essentially having this loss of information. Um, and it turns out that this actually only happens to about 4,200 structures within the materials project data set of 36,000. Um, and despite this, it has a huge impact on the performance of formation energy. Um, in the trivial case, this happens a lot with atoms that, or with uh, crystals that have two atoms within the unit cell, um, just because they mirror each other's distances. Um, so those typically get collapsed. And in those cases, you lose essentially half your information. Um, and for those of you that are interested, the uh, pairs of atomic species that get collapsed away, this is a histogram of the top 10. Um, we haven't done uh, a large amount of research into it, whether or not there's a pattern here um, between these atomic species. But if you're interested in seeing that. Um, so this begs the question, can we still do collapsing and retain this performance? Um, and utilize the PDD graph? And the answer is yes, we just have to add an additional constraint. Um, so when we collapse two rows in the PDD, they, they already need to be less than our collapse tolerance, but we also need to make sure that the atomic species are the same before the collapsing can occur. And if we redo the exact experiment over again for uh, this new constrained version of collapsing, um, we can see that the PDD graph um, actually slightly improves upon the MAE of the crystal graph while being able to still shrink down uh, the size of the graph um, to roughly a little bit less than half. 
Um, interestingly, this actually does not affect the uh, band gap energy ME as much um, with actually the best score of all coming from when we did not add this uh, additional constraint. Uh, nonetheless, these, these MEs are just slightly better and have roughly half the size. Um, notice that the amount of what I call compression here uh, is a little bit higher because we stop collapses from occurring even despite having the same tolerance. Um, we then apply this to the T2 data set um, where uh, having this additional constraint of having the two atom species be the same is not actually a problem because the composition is uniform throughout the data set. Um, as we can see, the amount of compression that we can actually get um, for uh, even a reasonable tolerance of 10 to the negative fourth is just a quarter of the size of what the crystal graph would be, and actually gives us our best MAE. Um, and uh, this is likely just due to uh, preventing things like overfitting when you have like very tiny differences amongst your data um, and you can you can remove the the chance of overfitting then generalization is better and then scores on the uh, validation and test set are often better um, so that was one parameter the collapse tolerance for the PD graph the other parameter that we have to talk about is uh, k um, which is the number of nearest neighbors. Um, for the materials project, actually, we used a K of 12 um, and changing this K, uh, increasing it by any amount, actually did not have a very large effect on the MAE, didn't improve it in any significant way. Um, but for the T2 data set, this is actually not the case because the crystals are much larger, you need a higher K. Um, so this experiment essentially shows the effect of K on the MAE for the T2 data set, specifically on lattice energy, and how this affects the size of the graph that is created. And as we can see, even with a crystal graph of with a K of 16, the MAE is not as good as the PDD graph with just one shy on the number of K. Um, and if we increase K and accordingly decrease the MAE, um, the size of the graph is still half uh, with a K of 21, roughly half the number of edges and a third the number of nodes. So in this case, it would be more computationally efficient to use predictions using the PDD graph, and we'd be able to increase K um, if we have any, uh, for instance, hardware limitations. Jonathan, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the stable, does it make sense to include PDD with the same number um, K equals 16? Um, yes, I can include that. I, I kind of wanted to illustrate the fact that uh, even with a smaller K, the performance is almost just in line with just a difference of 0 0.003. Um, so yeah, it would be it would be slightly better with K equals 16. But yeah, I can I can add that. Yes, and when you say crystals larger, you you meant molecules are larger. Crystals are infinite, but uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. molecule um, maybe. Yeah, maybe next time it makes sense to include that molecule that has 42 atoms. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, why yeah, yeah, it's important to go uh, further away from any central atom. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, and then this is the final experiment just to illustrate uh, why uh, the crystal graph having this relationship with unit cell can be a problem. So for this experiment, we simply took a copy of the materials project uh, data and we took a thousand of the crystals and uh, changed their unit cells to super cells in one dimension. Um, we trained on, uh, we trained two models on each of the data sets and then made predictions on the exact same um, uh, validation test set. And then as you can see here, this is the difference between those two uh, individual predictions. Um, for the bulk of these, the change was about 0.5 to 1%, but there are some that are actually very large outliers up to about 250% change in their prediction, um, which is obviously a problem because we have the same underlying data. So running this model uh, for two different, uh, with the same underlying data can produce different um, predictions which is so, not so so jonathan one of the things mm -hmm. i know about alloys is they're very susceptible to having uh vacancies in the lattice mm -hmm. i you know would those be you know showing up when, when you you know have 
vacancies in uh, in the, the expanded cell, maybe another atom would, would seem to take its place. Um, by that, do you mean that they're disordered? Well, it's a kind of disorder. Usually the lattice is maintained, but some atoms may not have full occupancy. Well, mm, actually, in, you know, in some cases, there may actually be an, at, uh, an atom position missing. I see. Um, Vitaly, are you, do you have any idea about this? It would essentially take on uh, whatever happens with the PDD, the underlying PDD. A good question. Um, so far, we uh, consider that only the pure periodic case. In the materials project, actually, Jonathan could, could remind me, um, is, is there any difference between periodic crystals and crystals with disorder? Are they distinguished? Um, I believe they are, but for this particular data set, I do not think there are any crystals that have disorder. Uh -huh. Okay, so so your input data is ideally periodic. At least we consider it ideally periodic. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then finally, some conclusions. Um, so uh, the PDD graph that we've proposed here, it maintains or improves upon crystal graph results while being just a fraction of the size, making it more computationally efficient, allowing us to make predictions and do training faster. Um, and it is independent of the unit cell choice because the PDD, the underlying uh, representation, is independent of the unit cell choice. Um, some of the future work we want to do with this is try to find a way to embed local structure, for instance, uh, angles to try to disambiguate um, locally uh, different changes in, in structure that uh, require a large K in order to truly uh, differentiate. Um, some other tasks, uh, the PDD graph would, would make a good target for a generative model where you could do crystal structure prediction. And then finally, uh, we wanna extend the same methodology onto molecular property prediction. Um, and that is it. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Let us first thank Jonathan for his presentation. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Let me uh, stop recording and